But turning from comedy to the serious part, the latest controversy over the development of missiles in Europe, U.S. officials now say that the Soviet proposal for a moratorium is empty since they're close to deploying a new improved version of their SS-20s. This is one more indication of the continuing improvement of Soviet uh, strategic forces. And it is this improvement, according to the Pentagon, that is most upsetting to the balance of terror in the world. And one major reason for President Reagan's call for a space-based defense system. But the President's defense initiative has caused ripples in this country aiming directly at nuclear strategy, shaking the foundations of military spending, straining relations with allies, and deeply dividing the scientific community. Jeff Lawson reports. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. And so it was that President Reagan, just two years ago, issued his challenge to American science, a challenge to replace mutually assured destruction with mutual security, a challenge that has in turn deeply divided the scientific community, while it has also, in the view of many, brought the Soviets back to the bargaining table raise concern among America's allies, even though most recently NATO defense ministers approved the idea. The president calls it strategic defense. Others call it Star Wars. It is aimed at stopping Soviet missiles from reaching American and allied soil. It would involve a communications and weapons system that could detect, target, and destroy Soviet ICBMs. It would involve sophisticated weapons like laser, x-ray, and particle beams orbiting in space or shot from the ground. Weapons and sensors that proponents say would make nuclear weapons obsolete, but that critics say are too costly, too easily outwitted, and too dangerous. Max Kampelman, America's chief arms negotiator War, in Geneva, is now talking to the, the Soviets about strategic defense. Earth. We're not preparing for Star Wars. It is totally inaccurate to characterize it as such. We're trying to prepare for defense, which is the best premise and the best hope for peace. Strategic defense has been around for some time. One earlier version was called High Frontier, a much more modest proposal that would use existing technology. But by whatever name, this non-nuclear defense strategy is shaking the foundations of nuclear policy. It would work in three stages. Once a missile was fired from the Soviet Union, it takes about 30 minutes to reach the U.S. In that time, it passes through three separate phases of attack. The first and most critical for defense is called the boost phase. This occurs in the first five minutes after launch. At this point, the missile is still carrying its payload of up to 10 nuclear warheads. To destroy the missile here would essentially catch it with all its eggs in one basket. But to do so, critics charge, would require at least 100 and as many as 1,500 orbiting satellites, each costing a billion dollars and each highly vulnerable to attack. Lasers 10 million times more powerful than currently exist. Aiming devices of absolute perfection and a computer program to run it all that could only be written by other computers and could not be tested until actual combat. Besides, say the critics, such a system could easily be countered by, for example, speeding up the missile and shortening the boost phase to under one minute. After a missile was carried above the atmosphere, it enters the second phase called mid-course. Here it's even more difficult to disarm. At this point, the missile launches its warheads. Now there are ten missiles instead of one. At the same time, hundreds of decoys can be launched to full the defense. Critics charge that unless enough missiles are destroyed in the first boost phase, this subsequent cloud of nuclear destruction would overwhelm the defense in mid-course. The third and final stage is called the terminal phase. It occurs as the missiles re-enter the atmosphere. At this point, real warheads can be distinguished from decoys and would be shot down before they could get close enough to do any damage. This defense can only shield missile silos and command centers. It provides no real protection for people living in cities. In general, critics say that drawing a picture of a three-stage protective shield around the U.S. is a dangerous deception. It seriously overestimates the abilities of science, underestimates the simple countermeasures that can be taken, and detracts from the real business of arms control. Proponents of strategic defense say even if the screen is only partially successful, it will be an effective deterrent. If the Soviets cannot be sure of knocking out our retaliatory force, 
they will be less likely to attack. And in any case, the U.S. must begin defensive research to catch up with the Soviets. And we are publishing now, uh, after a lot of discussions, as I say, with the intelligence community, uh, part of what we know uh, about the Soviet efforts in this field. And they are very substantial. They've gone on for a long time. And they're very clearly pointed toward acquiring the precise kind of capability that they not only deride, but argue is so terribly destabilizing and dangerous. The first five years of strategic defense research will cost $26 billion. If the results are promising, the estimates run into the hundreds of billions to develop and deploy the system. Depending on your point of view, this is either the beginning of the end of nuclear terror or the beginning of a new and more deadly arms race. I'm Jeff Lawson, CBN News. Thank you, Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen, President Reagan has clearly done one thing. He shifted away from the so-called mutual assured destruction or mad philosophy into a brand new technique. And now the debate and the agenda is his for right or wrong. I wish on this program we had a lot longer to discuss it, but we have two distinguished uh, men to take both sides of the issue. First of all, in New from New York City, uh, Prof Professor Robert Jastrow, a physicist, founder of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies. He was chairman of NASA's Lunar Exploration Committee. And his recent articles on strategic defense uh, that have appeared in the New York Times and commentary magazines have caused quite a stir among the scientific community. He's now writing a book on the subject called, quote, How to Make Nuclear Weapons Obsolete. And uh, Professor Jastro, it's a pleasure to welcome you right now to this broadcast. Could you tell us why this thing's going to work? Many of your scientific colleagues uh, say it's a boondoggle. It'll take hundreds of satellites, costing possibly trillions of dollars. You know, my uh, disagreement on this program was supposed to be with uh, a, uh, a fellow uh, debater. I think it was Admiral Gaylor. But I find that uh, I'm in thorough disagreement with the complete introductory statement. All right. Rendered by your, uh, your news reporter. Okay, tell the us why. The fact is that the scientific community does not think this is unworkable. I attended a meeting yesterday in Washington of the leading aerospace and uh, astronautics professional organization in the country, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Thousands of uh, engineers working in this field. And it was clear from their reception of the talks by administration spokesmen that they are in unanimous accord that this is workable. The issue is, in fact, very simple. Do the American people want to be defended from a Soviet missile attack? 20 years ago, the answer was, yes, but there's no way to do it. Today, the answer is, yes, and we can do it. And there are no one except a few college professors, mostly in Northeastern institutions, who disagree with that assessment. Could you give us just the, the parameters? How many, how much would it cost, how long a time frame are we talking about? The, uh, uh, first defense to go into place uh, would consist of two layers. It would be at least 90% effective. That means nine out of ten Soviet warheads would be shot down before they reached their targets. And that would be a complete protection for the American people. Because a Soviet general who knows that only one warhead in ten is going to reach its target in this country knows he cannot hope to cripple our retaliatory power. He knows that if he launches a, a surprise attack against the United States, his own homeland will lie in smoking ruins within 60 minutes. And to do that would be a suicidal act for him. And no one has ever said that uh, insane people live in the Kremlin. They are sane even if they are cruel, and they will not attempt a suicidal act. Right. That kind of defense can be in place in the early 1990s, according to Secretary Schultz and Secretary Weinberger, and it could cost us $60 billion, which is only slightly less, uh, which is slightly less than what we spend in one year on keeping the Russians out of our territory by uh, modern weapons of mass destruction. Thank you, Professor. Just a minute now, I'll, I'll, we're going to switch now to Washington, D.C. Admiral Noel Geiler. Admiral Geiler is former Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Forces in the Pacific. He's a former Director of the National Security Agency and past Deputy Director of the Joint Strategic Target Planning Staff responsible for targeting nuclear missiles. Admiral Geiler also helped the Union of Concerned Scientists develop their critique opposed to the so-called Star Wars. It's called the fallacy of Star Wars. And Admiral Geiler, would you like to respond to Professor Jastrow? Uh, yes, I'm glad to do that. I think the Star Wars initiative reflects great credit on President Reagan's humanity, but great discredit on those who have given him the very uh, 
defective advice of the kind that we've heard from Professor Jastrow. As a matter of fact, the Star Wars is not feasible to defend people. It's not necessary to defend missiles. And it's not applicable to any of the other nuclear threats, of which there are as many as the ingenuity of man can figure out. Such things as cruise missiles, such things as bombers, such things as suitcase bombs, such things as ships with enormous nuclear weapons in their holes. We have open frontiers. We have no defense against that kind of thing. And even if we could stop ballistic missiles, which we cannot, it would still not protect our population. The land-based ballistic missiles are not, in fact, the principal part of our retaliatory forces. The majority of our nuclear warheads are in submarines, essentially invulnerable. And we have no need to take on the tremendous risks involved in turning over the conduct of starting a war at a moment of terrible crisis to a computer system that the most prominent computer scientists in this country say it is simply infeasible to make reliable because of the difficulty of writing a computer program that can be operate 10 to 100 million lines of instruction without flaw on the first go around. All right, sir. Let me go back to New York now. Professor Jastro, the floor is yours. I don't know how Admiral Gale's maritime experience gave him the competence to speak on writing software. The government's experts on this matter and the software industry assure us, and I have been assured personally by Gene McCarthy, a uh, computing science expert and the president of the American Association of Artificial Intelligence, that that software is perfectly feasible. It will take some time to develop, but it is not a, uh, a great problem. On the general matter, I must say that Admiral Gale's remarks are very impressive, but the American people see a basic issue here, and that is, do we want our government to defend us against a Soviet nuclear attack that could destroy this country in 30 minutes? And the answer is yes. I know the answer is yes because the polls. And the second question is, can we do it? And there, I would place my confidence in Dr. Jim Fletcher, the former head of NASA. For my taste, the most independent-minded uh, man who has examined this question, who said, after looking at the matter for five months with 50 of the best missile experts in the country, there is no doubt in his view that an early defense of the kind that cost $60 billion, a fairly small sum compared to what we're spending today every year on these weapons, uh, and in place in the early 1990s, uh, could protect, he said, and I quote him directly, uh, 90 to 99 percent of the nation's population and infrastructure. He didn't say missile silos, he said population and infrastructure, that means cities. So there's just a complete disagreement between mm -hmm. Admiral Gaylor on the one hand and Dr. Jim Fletcher on the other. Uh, let me ask you that one point that he made about the cruise missiles, the missiles in the, in the satchels, the ships that come close to shore, the uh, uh, bombs that are carried in bombers, that kind of thing. Uh, how do you deal with that in relation to the st strategic defense? Yes, you know, um, I sympathize with Admiral Gaylor because he has gotten very bad advice from Dr. Richard Garwin and others. Uh, for reasons I explain in this book I'm bringing out, the cruise missile is a snap. Any defense that can handle thousands of warheads and tens of thousands of decoys hurtling through space at 10,000 miles an hour can take care of a cruise missile flying at the speed of a commercial airliner, 550 miles an hour, uh, just like that. It's an easy threat. It's by no means difficult to deal with. It's a cinch. As for suitcase bombs, when we get rid of the cruise missiles, and we get rid of the bombers, and we get rid of the ballistic missiles, the last one to go will be the bomb in a suitcase. And there, hypersensitive detectors have been developed by Livermore and other laboratories that can sniff out radioactivity, oh, just uh, eons away, miles away. And that problem is not a great one either. We don't bother with it today because it is not the big problem. When it becomes the big problem, it'll be licked very easily. Admiral, uh what would you like to respond to Professor Jastro? Well, in the first place, I'm not going to respond by indulging in personalities. I made up my mind I wouldn't do that. The uh, statement that we can defend against cruise missiles by the same technology that we defend against ballistic missiles is just wrong. Cruise missiles are in the atmosphere. They're very close to the ground. 
They're an extremely difficult problem because by stealth technology they can be made practically invisible and we have no, absolutely no defense against them at the present time. Nor do we have any significant defense against bombers. Nor do we patrol our borders in the way that Dr. Jastrow suggests. Nor do we necessarily radiate radioactivity to be detectable at miles or for that matter at feet. None of those things are correct. Nor did Dr. Fletcher say as uh, Professor Jastrow quoted him. The Fletcher report, which I have read with some care, makes many, many reservations and caveats about defense. The important thing to remember is that it is not in our power to change a strategy from mutual assured deterrence to defense because it is not in our power to have a complete defense. Mutual assured deterrence is not in fact a strategy to be changed by a president or a premier. It is a condition. It is the condition that Einstein recognized when he said that the invention of the atom bomb requires that we change our way of thinking. And that is particularly true with respect to military affairs. Well, could I ask you one question? I think our time could is... I, could I get a oh, word yes, please, please, before please, you get off Professor, the air? Go ahead. No, Admiral Gale's statements, I know he means well, but they are just incorrect factually. Uh, laser beams penetrate right down to the ground, and a cruise missile flying at low altitudes is completely vulnerable to them. Furthermore, the stealth technology does not work against space-based radars. Thirdly, Jim Fletcher's report in Issues in Science and Technology, the fall 1984 issue of this National Academy of Sciences journal, has the statement I just quoted, uh, and he is invited to go and look it up. May I respond to yes, that? Yes, please, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the cruise missile business is not, as Dr. Jastrow just depicted it. As a matter of fact, lasers cannot penetrate down to the ground, as he says, unless you have perfectly clear skies. It's well known they don't go through clouds. It doesn't do anything about the difficulty of picking up the missile against the Earth background from space, which is an unsolved problem. The point is that there are so many ways to emplace these weapons beforehand, to deliver them by any one of the myriads of ways in which the ingenuity of man can think, that to suggest that to stop ballistic missiles works the problem is not rigorous and it's not complete. To suggest that ballistic missiles can work the problem when the countermeasures are simple, are obvious, are well within the state of the art and the program that is proposed to the extent that it's defined and it is not well defined is far farther out than anything of that kind. Now as to the computer issue, I am actually quoting a resolution of the Association of Computing Machinery. I am quoting the Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility. I am quoting independent and careful studies done at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I am quoting common sense, which says that this system, enormously more complicated than anything has ever been built before, is not going to work the first time around, even if it worked at all. Because no such yeah. system, much less complicated, has ever worked the first time around. You have to test them. You have to see whether they work as designed. Admiral, I, I want to interrupt you just one time, and we are running short, but maybe in about 60 seconds. There are two issues that I would have on my mind. Number one, uh, should we not at least spend some money on research on something that may well prove to be a deterrent to ballistic missiles? And number two, should we not uh, uh, be concerned about the fact that the Russians or the Soviets seem to be terribly against this system for some reason or other? Let me, let me talk to those two points quickly. In the first place, this is not really a research program. It's a development program. And even the Secretary of Defense has acknowledged that. And that's a very important point. Because when you get to development, it's almost impossible to turn these programs off. And the money is beginning to talk already. The snouts of the industries are twitching with the opportunity here. It will divert an enormous amount of money from real military needs. And I think I know what those are. And they have nothing to do with Star Wars. And so it is this bad program. It's a bad program because of its wastage. It's a bad program because it's illusion. It's folly. 
It's a bad program because it detracts from real military capability. It's a bad program because it will militate against arms control, the only real out to our nuclear peril. All right, what about the second question? Why are the Soviets so, so terribly upset about it if it really can't work? Well, the Soviets have their own competent scientists who have also made the same kind of analysis that it can't work. So your question is a puzzle, and I think the reason is that they think we have something up our sleeve. They have great confidence. They can't believe in our technical capability. They can't believe that a president would put his prestige on the line and we would put this kind of money on the line without having something up our sleeve. And the fact that we don't have anything up our sleeve is something that they're not quite willing to believe. They hear us say that, but uh, they're not quite willing to believe it. Well, thank you, Admiral. I think Professor Jastrow would say there's nothing up our sleeve. We really have something. Well, I I'd like to get one sentence in. I do. And that is that uh, if the Russians didn't think there was something good here, uh, they wouldn't be uh, spending $2 billion a year, which is what uh, was revealed to be their annual level of expenditure, on the laser defense alone. $2 billion a year is four times what we're spending this year in our Star Wars program, and it's twice what the President has asked the Congress for. They know this is a very promising thing. They're going to have it in the 1990s. The only question is whether the American people are going to be defended on their side. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I, well, we must conclude, but you, you've been very gracious to be with us. Robert Jastrow from New York and Admiral uh, Guyler from Washington. And we'll be back with more right after this break.